Kent's Robert Montgomery and Alyssa Landy in The Grand Duchess and the Waiter with Jean Lockhart and Alma Kruger. Lux presents Hollywood. Our stars, Robert Montgomery, Alyssa Landy, Jean Lockhart, Alma Kruger, and Lionel Pape. Our guests, Vince Barnett and Natalie Bucknell. Our producer, Cecil B. DeMille. Our conductor, Louis Silvers. On behalf of our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, welcome everyone to another hour in Hollywood. Attention, housewives. Here are three points to bear in mind for clothes protection. Lux flakes cut down runs in silk stockings by preserving the elasticity of the threads. They keep your clothes new looking so much longer by doing away with harsh cake soap rubbing. Lux flakes are so gentle that we include even your daintiest lingerie in saying, anything safe in water alone is safe in Lux. Try Lux tomorrow. And now, the producer of the Lux Radio Theater, Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. By birth and circumstance, tonight's stars are well equipped to play the parts of a noble woman and a waiter. Alyssa Landy happens to be the daughter of a countess, while Robert Montgomery proved his ability to wait by waiting nine years before fame and fortune came to him in Hollywood. Both are under contract to MGM. Bob left a job as a deckhand on an oil tanker to play tank towns and stock companies. He wrote for a while in Greenwich Village, but preferring three meals a day to art, went to Otto Kahn for advice and a loan. He got the advice. Once on Broadway, however, Bob's ability was quickly recognized. He turned down silent picture offers, but turned westward when talkies arrived. Off the screen... Bob's as serious as he's carefree on it. He's president of the Screen Actors Guild, an avid reader, an amateur farmer, and enjoys driving fast cars and hard bargains. In spare moments, he writes stories and carries on a perpetual game of backgammon with Frank Morgan. After months of playing, he and Frank each insists the other owes him $9. I first became acquainted with Alyssa Landis, Remarkable talents when I engaged her to star with Frederick March in The Sign of the Cross. Not only an accomplished actress, Alyssa is the author of five novels, considerable poetry, and a play now pending production in New York. She's a singer and pianist, and knowing several languages, has made pictures in France, Germany, and Sweden. Born in Italy, she's heard tonight as the Grand Duchess Xenia, whom we first meet in a Swiss hotel. All in all, a woman of the world. As the waiter, Robert Montgomery bears a tray in his hands, a napkin over his left arm, and the name of Albert. And with these nutshell introductions, the curtain rises on the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Alfred Savoy's comedy, The Grand Duchess and the Waiter, starring Robert Montgomery and Alyssa Landy with Jean Lockhart and Alma Kruger. scene is the lounge room of the Palace Hotel at Mantra, Switzerland. It's early evening, and except for the presence of Albert the waiter, the room is deserted. Albert, attired in a brass-buttoned waiter's coat and stiff-bosomed shirt, is slumped comfortably in an armchair, idly blowing rings of smoke at the ceiling. Matard, the hotel manager, enters the lounge. He sees Albert, stops short, and then stands watching him with ill-disguised irritation. Well, good evening, Albert. Oh, hello. Quite comfortable, I hope. Got everything you require. Yes, thank you. There's a draft, though. You might shut that door. Shut the door? You must be mad. Mad or insane. I don't know which. A fine waiter I've been landed with, sitting in the lounge room. And what's that you're smoking? That? Oh, that's a cigar. <coughs> Why? A cigar. 
You pick them up in the gutter, I suppose. No, not as a rule. Well, that's what you'll be doing soon enough if you don't look out. You don't happen to have a match on you, do you? Get out of that chair. Get up, I say. Uh huh. Well, if you insist. Do you realize that this is the first time in the history of this hotel that any of its staff, and a mere waiter, too, has dared to sit in the lounge? You don't say. Why, I wouldn't sit here myself, even though I am the manager. I know my place. What are you doing here? Just thinking. Thinking? Dreaming? Yes, that's it, dreaming. How did you know? Well, you're going to have a rude awakening, young man, the next thing you know. Is that so? That is so. It was only on Mr. Hapgood's recommendation that I employed you at all. But when he hears how you've been behaving... Oh, you're going to snitch, eh? Why, what do you mean, snitch? Yes. I said I'm going to tell you. That's what I thought you said. Oh, be quiet. Of all the hotels that Mr. Hapgood supervises, he sends you to this one. But wait, just wait. All right, I will. But what have I done wrong? What have you done right? That's what I want to know. Well, I haven't had much experience. Now, don't I... talk nonsense. It isn't experience that counts in our profession. It's instinct. Instinct? Oh, yes. Now, how many tips have you had during the last week? Tell me that. Well, as a matter of fact, I... None. Not one. I thought as much. Oh, you're of no use at all. It isn't my fault that people forget to tip me. Not your fault. Why, of course it is. Nobody's going to tip you unless you insist upon it. How on earth can I insist upon it? Quite easily. You have finished serving. Yeah. Do you leave? No. Yeah, no. You say, uh, mm -hmm. uh, will, uh, will that be all, monsieur? I see. Everything quite satisfactory, monsieur? I see, and then I hold out my hand. Oh, no, you don't have to. <clears throat> It's merely a question of will, strength of character, the power of the human eye. No, 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 it wouldn't work if I tried it. Well, it would if you had any brains, any tact. Oh, but you'll never learn. The perfect waiter is born, not made. I thought I was getting pretty good at the waiting part of it. You're lamentable, absolutely lamentable. Directly a crisis arises, you're done. Yes. Now, when you're waiting on our ordinary clients, you do manage to make go some sort of a show. Yes, that's what I thought. But I... when it's something unusual, why, you lose your head completely. Yes, I... Now, what happens when you serve vegetables at the Grand Duke's table? Oh. You tremble all over. That's right. Your knees knock together so loudly it can be heard in the next room. Yes. And tonight at dinner, you dropped and spilled the melted butter down the Grand Duchess's back. Oh, did I do that? It must have slipped. You slipped. Yes, and you were in such a daze that I don't believe you even noticed it. Well, you must have burnt her highness badly. Burnt her? Good Lord, I must have looked like a halfwit. You exaggerate by 50%. Yes, perhaps you're right. <laughs> The Grand Duchess could never care for a quarter weight, could Care she? the Grand... What are you talking about? Monsieur well, Mathieu, what is it? The Grand Duchess, she has been calling for a waiter. But where is she? In the private lounge I with Countess of Alloff and the two Grand Dukes. Oh, send Louis, I... send Ormond. I've been looking I for them, be... monsieur, but Louis is all... Oh, Ormond. why did I ever become the manager of a hotel? Albert, you'll have to go. Now, quick. I'm on my way. But for heaven's sake, don't spill anything. Come in. Good evening, Your Highness. What is it? Uh, you asked for a waiter? That was ten minutes ago. Yes, but I... Uh... Never mind now. Coffee for four. And uh, one brandy. Uh, one brandy, two brandies. Uh, uh, uh... Coffee for four and now, two brandies. Now, go brand... on, go on. <clears throat> yes, Your Highness. You would order a brandy, Uncle Paul? My dear girl, why not? Haven't I just been telling you, all of you, that we're in desperate financial straits? But Zany, just two brandies? It can't be as bad as that. Oh, but it is, Peter. What do you think we've been living on? We haven't paid a bill for two months. Oh, but I'm sure the manager trusts us, Your Highness. Of course he does. But what's going to happen when he presents his bill? Well, I suggest that we uh, 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 worry about that when the time comes. I'm not worrying, Peter. I'm merely advising all of you that our funds are very low. Oh. Uh... And you may be a Grand Duke, Peter. And you too, Uncle Paul. But even Grand Dukes must dine occasionally. But, Your Highness, the jewels, are they all gone? You've only got to look at me to see... For a year and a half after the revolution, we lived on what I wore on my fingers. My wrists proved enough for the next two years. After that, my ears kept us going for another six months. Today, there's nothing left but my neck. Your necklace? Oh, no, Your Highness, you can't tell that. Ah, the Empress necklace. Peter, stop speculating. It's the only thing we have left. Impossible. I absolutely forbid it. While it was only your rings, tiara, and bracelets, I raised no objection. Those trinkets I should be able to replace someday. Mm, someday. Well, yes, and very soon, too, I hope. But the imperial necklace, oh, that's quite a different matter altogether. Why, it's irreplaceable. 
Unique. I entirely agree, Paul. Uh, you know, Zania, it's always been a family arrangement. It was the will of the late emperor that uh, someday you and I should get married. Mm, someday. Eh? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm speaking, therefore, with the authority of your future husband when I forbid you to sell that necklace. We haven't sunk to that yet. My poor Peter. And I may add that as far as I'm concerned, you needn't bother. I'm earning my own living. You earning your living? You mean to say that you're at work? Yes, I'm... Well, it's uh, not work exactly. It's uh, more what you might call uh, business. It's like this. I buy an automobile on credit, you see, and then I sell it again <laughs> a little cheaper for cash. Is that all? That's all, but as I've managed to do it four times during the last month, I've made a profit of nearly 200,000 francs. 200? How what? Uh, did you get such a wonderful idea? I don't know. It just uh, came to me. Why, it's an inspiration. <laughs> you flatter me, Uncle Paul. No, I only say what I think. Yes, there's no doubt that men of our class possess a sort of innate superiority over ordinary people, and we can't help showing it. Even when we forsake our own sphere to engage in a vulgar thing like trade. Peter, huh? how much of that 200,000 francs have you got left? Oh, uh, uh, well, as a matter of fact, just mm, for the moment. Nothing at all. That charming lady of the chorus whom you see so much of. Uh, what charming? Uh, how did you know? Well, everybody knows. She's taken everything from you, I understand, even your diamond studs. Mm. Really, Peter, as a future husband, you have some qualities that are not altogether attractive. Zania, now well, I'm I... not jealous. But let me give you a word of advice. Try wearing bone studs in the future, and perhaps you'll be able to keep them. But Zania, dear... Oh, I must I... also ask you not to meddle in my affairs. I do what I do because it's my duty. You believe me when I say that at heart I... Well, I, I should have preferred... Oh, but you wouldn't understand. Uh, I'm afraid I don't. Come in. The coffee, Your Highness? Well, don't stand there holding it up in the air. Put it down. Yes, Your Highness. I... Oh, oh, you lovely oh, 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 Nothing spilled. Oh. Are you in the habit of setting down trays in that I'm manner? so sorry, Your Highness. It slipped a little. Slipped? Slipped. A little. And the table, too. It's a bad table to serve on. You see, downstairs, the tables are lower. They're at least two inches difference, Your Highness. Oh, well, that explains... Uh, yes. What has that got to do with Well, it? a great deal, Your Highness. When one is used to serving on a low table and suddenly encounters a high table, the impulse is to let the tray down to the height of the low table. Well, well, well. Well, well, that's what I did. I... Uh, uh, get out. Wait a minute. Aren't you the same waiter who poured the melted butter down my back at dinner? Yes, Your Highness. That was I. Well, you seem proud of it. Oh, oh no, just pleased that Your Highness remembers me. I... Uh, get out. <coughs> yes, Your Highness. Uh, is there... Uh, <coughs> will uh, <coughs> that be all, Your Highness? Uh, what? Uh, is, uh, is everything uh, quite satisfactory, Your Highness? No. Oh, oh. Uh. I told the manager it wouldn't work if I tried it. What did he say? Oh, the man's demented. Yeah, we ought to uh, do something mm, about it. We will. Remind me in the morning to speak to the manager. We'll have him discharged before breakfast. Albert. Uh-huh. What are you doing? Polishing the silver? Well, you can stop. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're discharged. What? Are you deaf? You're discharged? Have you written to Mr. Hapgood already? Oh, I don't have to write to him. I'm discharging you at the request of the Grand Duchess Zania. I refuse to offer my resignation. Resignation? <laughs> Are you crazy? You're through. You're finished. Pack your bag and get out. Where is Her Highness? Oh, it won't do you any good to appeal to her. Uh, get away from that pole. Hello, connect me with the Grand Duchess suite. Stop, do you hear what I say? Stop pushing, will you? I'm going to ask her myself. Yes, this is the Countess of Alof. Albert? Oh, not Prince Albert of Latvonia. What? Albert the wait? How dare you? Who was that, Proskovia? No one, Your Highness. Good. I'm in no mood to speak to anyone this morning. Uh, your Highness is sad. Strangely enough, no. Now that I've at last decided to part with the necklace, I feel a sense of relief. After all, what does it matter? What does anything matter nowadays? Peter been here this morning? Yes, Your Highness. He left, but he left immediately. He's gone to speak to the jeweler. Did he take the necklace with him? No, Your Highness. It's there in the jewel box. Mm, I suppose Peter will haggle for a week or two about the price. Your Highness, don't you think you should keep the necklace in the hotel safe? Oh, don't be silly. But it's worth a fortune, and with so many robberies... Well, they won't rob the Grand Duchess, Dania. Let that be enough. 
Yes, Your Highness. Well, I shall want the cart for today, Countess. A ride would be good for me. A walk would be better, Your Highness. What? The chauffeur gave notice last night. He's gone. Why? Money. Poor fool, he should have waited till I sold the necklace. Well, we shall get someone else. Who is it? It's Albert. You! Get out of here. Uh, one moment, please. I thought you were discharged. Yes, I, I was, Your Highness, but you needn't be alarmed. I won't upset anything. I won't break anything or spill anything. You see, I have nothing in my hands except a napkin. This useless and perfectly hateful napkin. And why is it hateful? Well, because it's a symbol of my lowly station, Your Highness. It weighs a ton. Then why don't you put it in your pocket? You don't mind. <laughs> Thank you. There, I feel better already. Your Highness, what an extraordinary way. <laughs> I'm glad I'm able to make you laugh. I know how little gaiety there is in Your Highness's life. What do you mean? And, uh, oh, have I said too much? It would appear so. You Swiss believe too much in democracy. Swiss? No, not me. I'm an American. Really? What's an American way to doing in a Swiss hotel? Well, it's a long story, Your Highness. Then we shan't bother with it. Uh, very good, Your Highness. But might I be allowed to ask Your Highness a question? No. Understand whatever your name is. Albert, Your Highness. Understand, Albert. Etiquette does not permit me to be asked questions. That must be rather a handicap to general conversation. Yes. Well, I promise not to ask any questions, but I have a request to make to Your Highness. A humble, a very humble petition. Impossible. All petitions must first be addressed to Countess Avalov, my lady-in-waiting. It is for her to decide whether they shall be passed on to me. I see. Uh, Countess Avalov, I beg of you, I beseech you to convey my petition to Her Highness. It depends on what it is. Whether I think it's suitable. I admit that I'm not a very experienced waiter. I'm clumsy, I know. I lose my head when I pass the asparagus. Mm, yes, go on. We know about that. But is that sufficient reason to blight my young career? To nip it in the bud? Hmm. I shall improve in time. I know I shall. And even if I haven't any of the qualities necessary to a good waiter, I may possess other virtues, unsuspected, hidden away, which are just as admirable. Is it not so? It's possible. Undoubtedly. Countess Avalov. I am devoted to Her Highness. What? In a nice way. I am devoted to her with a loyalty, with a passion that mocks the power of words. All that I ask is to be allowed to serve her with the last breath in my body, with the last drop of my blood. In Her Highness's service, I should live in ecstasy. I should die content. That, Countess Avalov, is the petition I beg you to lay at the feet of Her Highness. Is that all? That's all. I refuse to forward your petition. You refuse? It's already in the wastebasket. Countess Avala. Your Highness. Forward the man's petition. It, it is Your Highness' wish. It's my command. You may go, Albert. Huh? <laughs> Thank you, Your Highness. Schopenhauer was evidently right. Who, Your Highness? Schopenhauer, the German philosopher. He said that monarchy was the form of rule most natural to mankind. Mm. The common people in their hearts are still loyal to their rulers. And when we find a man like that, a mere waiter, who can express himself on the subject with so much eloquence, so much obvious sincerity, how can we doubt that someday our people will return to a reasonable form of government? Uh, nothing is more certain, Your Highness. Yes. I'm glad I told the manager to discharge him. Now I can find something for him to do in my own household. What? He might even act as my chauffeur. We need one. As Your Highness wishes. Your Highness commands, and of course I can only obey. What's the matter? Have you anything against him? No, Your Highness, nothing. Nothing? Mm -hmm. I merely ask if Your Highness is certain she is not making a mistake. A mistake? Is that waiter really the devoted monarchist that Your Highness seems to imagine? Oh, you're absurd. You see spies everywhere. Oh, I don't for a moment suggest that Albert's a spy. What I think he may be is... Well, uh, well, go on. Well, it isn't altogether impossible. The man may be in love. In love? With whom? With, uh, with your highness. Praskovia, it's a long time since I boxed your ears. Your highness. You're mad, absolutely mad. Yes, your highness. There can't be anybody so idiotic as you in the whole world. Oh, no, your highness. Look, terrible times we've been through have upset your mental balance. Oh. The whole world's gone mad, I know. But even so, there must be some limits to its folly. Oh. There are few things left that one may still regard as impossible. Uh, yes, Your the Highness. The servant this waiter in love with me. How dare you to imagine such a thing? Well, I, I don't know. But you must know. Explain yourself. Well, really, I, I, I can't. But, well, you see, yes. for the last week, he's certainly been... Been making eyes at your highness. Making eyes at yes. me. Proskovia, yes. leave the room at once. Uh, yes. Go and don't dare come back until my temper's had time to cool down. Yes, yes your highness, yes. <laughs> Matt? 
Matard. Oh, Matard. What is it? Come out in the driveway a minute, will you? What do you mean by jelly? Oh, so it's you. Will you tell Her Highness her car's here? You are working for her now, yes. Well, you fired me. Tell her, will you? Tell her yourself. She's coming now. Your Highness. I asked you to be here at four, Albert. I'm so sorry, Your Highness. Uh, there wasn't any gasoline in the car. Oh, uh, uh, you put some in, I hope. Uh, yes, Your Highness. Uh, remind me to reimburse you at the end of the month. Where to, Your Highness? Anywhere. But before we start, I hope you're better at driving than you are at serving. Oh, oh, oh your, your Highness will be amazed. I hope so. At serving, Your Highness, I admitted that I was totally inexperienced. Really? But behind the wheel, I'm a new person. I understand automobiles. I admire your confidence. You've been driving long? Ten years, Your Highness, without an accident of any kind. An enviable record. Uh, what the... It might help if you turned on the switch. Your Highness... Did you say anywhere, Your Highness? Anywhere. All I want to do is relax and breathe fresh air, so go slowly. It will be a pleasure to serve, Your Highness. A great pleasure. You are devoted. Here, what are you doing? Stop! Stop! There's something wrong. Look out! Look out! Fool you! Look what you've done. Look at the car. Well, what have you got to say? I'm so sorry, Your Highness. Something must have slipped again. Before we go on with the Lux Radio Theater's presentation of The Grand Duchess and the Waiter, let's stop in at one of Hollywood's department stores. It's closing time, and Lola and Irene, two salesgirls in the corset department, are totaling their sales for the day. Haven't you finished adding that yet, Lola? Four and three or seven, and one or eight, and four or twelve. There, that's what I call a record, over $112 in one day. Over $112? Mm-hmm. How do you do it? With the help of Lux. Lux? You don't sell Lux. <laughs> of course not, silly. But you can't wear a girdle and Lux it at the same time. You need at least two if you're to take proper care of them. Naturally. But then you spend twice as much. How do you explain that to your customers? <laughs> ah, that's easy. Buying two is so much more economical in the long run. When you Lux them oftener, they actually last longer. Lola's right. Alert women are discovering for themselves the economy of Lux care for girdles and foundations. Frequent luxing not only keeps them fresh and protects their fit, but actually prolongs their wear. These fine tissue-like flakes preserve elasticity, you know. They dissolve quickly in cool water. Hot water is bad for elastic fabrics. Soaps containing harmful alkali weaken elasticity. Lux has no harmful alkali. Anything safe in water alone is safe in Lux. Remember to get a box tomorrow. As you know, these gentle flakes preserve the life and luster of all your dainty things. And now, Mr. DeMille. With Alyssa Landy as the Grand Duchess, Robert Montgomery as the waiter, and an all-star cast, we continue our play. After wrecking the automobile, Albert was given another chance in Her Highness' service, but not behind the wheel. He's been reduced to the position of footman and general handyman, bearing it with more than goodwill in order to be near the Duchess. It's a week later, and in his royal employer's suite, Albert is very carefully serving breakfast to Her Highness and the Grand Duke Paul. Uh, how many lumps, Your Highness? Two, and if you spill anything, I'll have you flogged. Yes, very good, Your Highness. I have mine black. Yes, Your Highness. Well, I suppose Peter's out again this morning, Xenia. He's out every morning. I can't understand. He's been haggling for a week with that blasted jewel. Shh, Uncle Paul. What? Oh, uh, yes, of course. You may go, Martin. Martin? I said you may go. The name is Albert, Your Highness. I prefer to call you Martin. Avoid confusion with the Prince of Latvonia. Oh, Your Highness flatters me. Well, never mind that. Run along. (coughs) Wait, answer that. Yes, Your Highness. Hello? Hello, Martin speaking. Martin, Your Highness. Who is it? The Grand Duke Peter. Hello, Your Highness. Yes, Martin. No, no, Your Highness. Albert is no longer here. This is Martin. Give me that phone. (laughs) Yes, Your Highness. 
Hello, Peter. What do you want? What? What? Well, where are you? Oh, Peter. Senior, what is it? But, Peter, they can't do that. Oh. Oh, I see. I, I, I see. Senior, for the love of heaven, what? Speak louder. Yes. Yes, of course. Well, very well. Senior, what is the matter? The Grand Duke Peter's in jail. What? In jail. But what for? He sold too many motor cars on credit. Good Lord, I knew. I knew that scheme was too good. What are we going to do? To do? Well, what is the... Well, I don't know. If I may speak, Your Highness. Uh, well? Under the circumstances, the best possible course of action is to bail him out. Oh, uh, yeah, yes, certainly. Yes, uh, yes, of course, we... Uh, uh, <laughs> if Your Highness will leave it in my hands. Oh, of course. Thank you, Martin. I'll see the authority. Uh, and Martin? Yes, Your Highness? Um, uh, remind me to reimburse you at the end of the month. <laughs> yes, Your Highness. Albert? Albert? Why don't you answer me? The name is Martin. Her Highness changed it. Oh, bother. Have you seen Her Highness Barstow? You're the maid here, Henrietta, not me. Really? Really. Then what are you doing in Her Highness' room? Don't be saucy. It doesn't become you. I'm here because she told me to come here. Oh. She's getting awfully friendly with you, isn't she? She doesn't know I exist. Oh, yes, she does. Ever since you got the Grand Duke Peter out of jail, you've become her little pride and joy. You don't have to get so upset about it. I'm not. But every time she wants anything, she calls you. And even if she doesn't want anything, she thinks up something to want, so she'll have an excuse to call you. Are you sure of that? You don't have to look so happy about it. If I were you, I'd remember that she's a grand duchess, and you're nothing but a waiter. Oh, you're letting your imagination run away with you. So are you. Oh, Albert, don't let's argue. I don't like to argue. <laughs> Especially with you. Now, the name is Martin. Well... Then, Martin, don't let's argue. Hmm? Excuse me, I, I... Oh, no, wait. Why do you always run away when I speak to you? Run away? Don't be silly. Oh, but I... you do. Don't you like me? Of course I like you. I like everybody. It's my disposition. You no. Know, a girl could get to like you easily. Is that so? Albert, Now, I... here, stop it. You're choking. Oh, me. Albert, now, don't do that, I... please. Oh, Lord. Just what is going on here? Oh, Your Highness, Silence. I... Silence. Martin, I'm ashamed of you, my yes. own servant. Oh, but Your Highness, you... Get out. Y y yes, Your Highness. Well, what have you got to say to yourself? Nothing, Your Highness. Fine servant you are. You spill things down my back, wreck my car, and I find you kissing my maid. There's no limit to your audacity? Audacity? I'll tell Countess Avalov about this. She'll put a stop to your romance. Oh, Your Highness, you're not going to discharge me. No. <sighs> Thank you. Does it really mean so much to More you? More than Your Highness will ever know. Why? Your Highness, Stop. I... I don't want to know. But I'll keep an eye on you in the future. You've had too much liberty. That's what's the matter with you. In the future, you'll be within call all the time. Even uh, at night? Yes. You can sleep outside my room. What? Outside my door, on the mat. Uh, on, the, on the mat? That's where Ivan used to sleep. Poor old Ivan. He's now so crippled with rheumatism, he can't sleep at all. Has it ever occurred to Your Highness that poor Ivan may be crippled with rheumatism from having slept on Your Highness's mat? You would think of that, of course. It's just like you. Anyhow, I give you permission to bring a rug. You'll be quite comfortable. Your Highness. Well? It's quite impossible for me to sleep here outside Your Highness's door. It would be fatal. You're afraid of Ivan's rheumatism. No. I'm ashamed of you. It would be absolutely fatal. Not necessarily. But if it were, you may be sure you'd be given a decent burial. Oh. You may leave now. And don't forget, you're to report to me here at 11 tonight with the mat. Yes, with the mat. Yes. Ten, I wonder where Xenia is. I don't know. She said she wanted to speak to us after dinner, and then she disappeared. You know, she's been acting very strangely of late. Have you noticed it? No. Ah, yeah, she wouldn't. But she has. And I think she must be in love. Uh, who? Why, Xenia. Oh. Oh, no, I don't think so. Uh, besides, uh, whom would she be in love with? Well, she's engaged to you. Eh? Oh, oh, yes. Good evening. Oh, Xenia, at last. 
Well, we've been waiting for you. Yes, my dear. Where have you been? I went for a walk. I wanted to think. Think? Why, my dear Don't girl... Don't be so horrified, Peter. Peter, some people do think, you know. Well, you said you wanted to see us, Senor. Yes. Something astonishing has, has happened. Ah, I knew it. What? No, nothing. Go on. Well, listen. For the last two weeks, Peter's been trying to sell the necklace. Sell the necklace? Well, he hasn't been successful. No, that confounded jeweler won't meet our price. Never mind. During that time, we've been very hard-pressed for cash. That's true. But tonight, before dinner, I happened to look in the drawer of my desk, and I found 25,000 francs. 20, oh, what luck. But I can't remember putting them there. That's why, before you dressed before, for dinner, I asked you to turn out your pockets and make a note of exactly how much money each of us had. You, Uncle Paul, had a thousand francs, new Peter, six hundred and fifty. Yes. Now, uh, do you mind counting your money again? Well, it's not if you wish it. Let me see, uh, six, seven, nine, eleven. Well, well, this is funny. I seem to have another four hundred francs. That's curious. I've got an extra two hundred. There. You see? Well, this is very, uh... Uh, unusual. How did it happen? Well, that's the problem we've got to solve. Well, it appears very much as though we're the objects of a secret and generous charity. Ah, uh, but who is our anonymous benefactor? That's what I'd like to know. Uh, you don't suspect me, do you? No, Peter. You're right. I couldn't manage it. There's been rather a slump in the motor trade. Have you cross-examined the servants? They know nothing whatever about it. Well, they must have connived at it. Money doesn't drop from the skies. At least, uh, that's not its usual habit. No, more's the pity. I don't understand it, and it annoys me. Well, um... Uh, uh, what shall we do about it? Nothing. That is until we've had a chance to think it over. Sleep on it tonight, and we'll talk further in the morning. What time is it, Uncle Paul? Well, it's going on for 11. 11? I must go to my room. Good night, Uncle Paul. Good night, Zeno. Good night, Peter. Uh, good night, my dear uh, love. <laughs> uh, good evening, Your Highness. Well, what are you doing in my sitting room? Your Highness told me I was to sleep at her door. I always go to bed at this hour, so here I am. What's that you're carrying? It's a dressing gown, Your Highness, and pajamas. Pajamas? Silk pajamas? Yes, I've slept in them for years. But are we coming to the lower classes wearing silk pajamas? We have to have some enjoyment, Your Highness. Silk pajamas are small compensation for the dreary existence of a waiter. Yes, I suppose so. You know, Martin, you're a very interesting person. Thank you. You're a little insane, of course. Of course. But nevertheless interesting. I think I enjoy talking to you. Every word your highness addresses to me is a glittering jewel flung from the stars. I treasure it. You really feel that way? That's only part of it. There's more? Much more. If your highness only knew how I worshipped... Stop. I don't want to hear it. I'm going to my room. Yes, your highness. Good night. Good night, your highness. Oh, uh, by the way, before I go, let me give you a word of advice, or perhaps I should say of warning. I'm of rather a nervous disposition, and I keep a revolver under my pillow. And if by any accident you happen to open my door unexpectedly, you'd be greeted with six bullets, not one of which would miss its mark. I think you understand. Yes, perfectly, Your Highness. Good night. Good night, Your Highness. Oh, Your Highness. I can't sleep. You didn't allow much time to try. Did no you? use, I can't. <clears throat> I want to talk. Shall I call the Countess Valov? No, you do. Thank you. You said... One moment, whose keys and things are those on the table? They're mine. This your handkerchief, too? Yes, Your Highness. Pure silk. Must have cost at least a hundred francs. Yes, yes, very likely. It was a present. Uh, from a woman? Uh, yes, Your Highness. Hmm. What's this thing? It's my wallet. You know, for money. Chagrin with a gold clasp. Another present? Uh, yes, Your Highness. From uh, the same woman? No, no, Your Highness, from another one. It was last year. I congratulate you on your constancy, the perfect lover. And who are you keeping company with now? Uh, no one, Your Highness. Why not? I'm in love. With whom? I don't dare to tell you, but it's I... It's lucky for you, you don't. <sighs> yes, Your Highness. Uh, may I have my wallet, please? Why? Well, it is mine. Well, what's in it? Your Highness is too inquisitive. How dare you? I'll see for myself. Your Highness. Stand back. Hmm. You're well supplied with money, aren't you? Uh, there are over 30,000 francs here. Why do you carry so much? Well, it's just an old habit of mine. I... I think I'm beginning to understand something. Those banknotes I found in my desk. The numbers follow these in your pocket. Your Highness, I'm sure that... So it's you who put those notes in my desk. And not only that, but you've been putting money in my purse, too. Well, speak up. Why have you done this? Your, your Highness is so, so extravagant. Extravagant? Well, aren't you? Uh, but why? 
Why on earth do you do this? What's your object? It had to be done. The manager's about to present his bill. I knew your highness was, uh, was embarrassed and afraid you might have to leave the hotel. I didn't want that. Let me see exactly how I stand. I like things to be plain and above board. The simple truth of the matter is that for the last three weeks I've been supported by a waiter. Well, of course, if you put it like that... I, I... admire your impertinence. Well, I... Liberty's a wonderful thing, isn't it? When it enables a man to take such liberties. A waiter, a domestic servant, pierced... But where did you get all this money? Your Highness, I... How on earth could you have so much? That's the thing I, I can't it's say. It's not difficult to guess. Thief, that's what you are. Thief? One of a gang of hotel robbers. Yes, perhaps you're right. The leader? Naturally. A murderer? Your Highness. If this were before the revolution, I'd have you sent to the salt mine. Yes. But it's not too late, even now. I shall telephone the police. The telephone's over there on the desk. Give it to me. Certainly, Your Highness. Uh, shall I ring them for you? Yes, please. <clears throat> Hello? Give me the police station. What? Oh, no, any police station. We've got a thief here, and we want to hand him over. <laughs> Hello? Is that the police station? Oh, wait. Wait, please. <clears throat> Will Your Highness speak to them herself? No, I, I can't do it. You know I can't. It's more than I can bear. No, no, hello. She can't do it, and you know she can't do it. It's more than she can bear. <laughs> Goodbye. I love you. Oh. I've loved you. I've loved you for so long. I can't help it. I had to. Oh, stop, stop. Please go, Martin. I beg of you. No, Your Highness, and after what's happened between us, I can no longer be Martin to you. Call me Albert. Albert, like the Prince of Latvonia. Albert, go away. Please, please. Oh, I love you. I do. But, oh, don't you understand? You must go away. You love me, too? How long have you loved me? That day you burnt me with that horrible melted butter. Oh, yes. It was then I suddenly realized... Not till then. I realized much earlier. When? Well, it was ten minutes earlier when I was serving the soup. I loved you so much I didn't know what I was doing. Luckily, they took the soup green away from me. The manager gave me the devil. Oh, how unjust it is. No, no, I deserved it. Oh, it's too unjust. Here am I, the most virtuous, the proudest of princesses, in love with a waiter. Zelia. Why did you call me? Xenia. So it's come to this. A waiter has the right to call me Xenia. Now, look here. You're not going to be silly about this, oh, are don't you? don't you understand? I am the Grand Duchess Xenia. For generations, my family's been of noble blood. Our men have married queens. Our women, princes. Well, couldn't you make an exception in this case? Stop. Stop. I'm sorry, Xenia. Look up here. I want you to promise me one thing. Yes. Don't marry anyone else until you hear from me. But... I... but... Promise? I love you, Albert. Darling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ma, my stockings, Henrietta. Yes, Your Highness. Your Highness is unusually gay this morning. <laughs> Am I, Proskovia? Perhaps. Is there any particular reason? Perhaps. Will you find Albert Henrietta? Oh. Ask him to come up here. Yes, Your Highness. Mm -hmm. The Grand Duke Peter has seen the jeweler again, Your Highness. Well, they've agreed upon a price. Good. Did you get the necklace, please? It's in the jewel box. The jewel box? Yes. Well, it wasn't there this early this morning, Your Highness. What? Huh? But it hasn't been there for days. I assumed Your Highness had placed it in the hotel safe. Are you mad? Get me that box. Uh, yes, Your Highness. I haven't worn it in ages, and I remember putting it back in the case the last time Here, I... Here, Your Highness. Let me see. It's gone. Your Highness! It's been stolen. But are you sure well, that you... Of course you... I'm sure. I've never kept it in any other place but here. Oh, well, Your Highness, what are you going to do? We must notify the police. Yes. Your Highness. Henrietta, quick, tell the Grand Duke Paul I'm see him at once. Yes, Your Highness. Wait, where's Albert? Oh, uh, I couldn't find him, Your Highness. What? I asked the manager, and he told me that he left. Oh, what? He's left the hotel early this morning. Oh. Albert's gone, but, but he's coming back. I don't think so, Your Highness. He had two suitcases with him. Your Highness. Be quiet. He's gone. I don't understand. He's stolen your necklace. That's oh, why he's don't gone. Don't be a fool. He, he couldn't. But the money. He had all that money. Oh, would a thief stay here after he'd stolen a necklace? Would a thief put money in my desk? He might. I always said there was something strange about that man. He's mad enough to do anything. The money, a week ago. Mm. He'd have had time to realize on the necklace. Yes, it all fits perfectly. Oh. It's the only solution. But last night he said... No, I, I won't believe it. I won't. He couldn't have been a thief. No. <laughs> he couldn't, you hear? No. He's only gone out somewhere. He'll, he'll be back. He must come back. Oh, Your Highness, please. Clerk! Oh, clerk! One moment, monsieur. But I'm in a hurry. 
Yes, monsieur. What is it? I want a first-class ticket, please, on the next train to Paris. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We interrupt the Grand Duchess and the waiter to hear from the nation's most notorious head waiter. Employed by hosts for the express purpose of embarrassing guests, all in fun, of course, he's really a character actor, having appeared in 125 films in the last five years. As a practical, practical joker, he's told Einstein he knows nothing about relativity. Picture stars like Jeanette MacDonald, Jean Harlow, and Mary Pickford that their table manners were atrocious, Colonel Lindbergh, that he didn't know the difference between a cockpit and a peach pit, and he made George Bernard Shaw, England's greatest ribber, call quits after 20 minutes of heckling. Ladies and gentlemen, with full knowledge of the risks I'm running, I introduce Mr. Vince Barnett. Thanks, Mr. DeMille. Yes, it's my pleasure to make as big a nuisance out of myself as possible. But though I may be public pest number one, I can honestly say that my victims and I have always parted the best of friends. I've impersonated scores of people, but find that a head waiter offers about the greatest field for a man's talents as a practical joker. You can mix up the food orders, criticize the table manager's manners of the guests, interrupt the speech makers, and shout back when anyone dares complain about the service. I particularly remember a dinner here in Hollywood attended by... 400 of the biggest names in pictures, stars and executives. Charlie Chaplin was entertaining some guests at his table with amusing capers. I went over to him in my waiter's garb, flourishing my napkin in his face, told him to stop making a fool of himself. You don't have to balance all of us on your nose to attract attention here. Everybody knows who you are, and they're sick and tired of seeing any more of you politics. Chaplin's face turned scarlet. Marion Davies, who was at his table, proceeded to give me a tongue lashing for my impudence, but suddenly recognized me. She suggested I leave the dumbfounded chaplain and pick a second victim. I did. He was Winnie Sheehan, then head of Fox Studios. He and Winston Churchill were gre greeting a group of distinguished women when I shoved my way through and shook my finger under his nose. You are offending these ladies, I scolded. Besides, you, how can the waiters get around you with their trays when you block up the aisles? Mr. Sheehan was so dumbfounded he couldn't say a word, so I continued. The ladies don't matter so much, but the waiters have work to do. Get back to your table and I call the police and have you put out. <laughs> Mr. Sheehan still remained speechless, but he grabbed the nearest chair and was about to obliterate me when Miss Davies interrupted what might have been an act of public service. What I fail to understand, Vince, is how after years of annoying the innocent, you're still all in one piece. Oh, I've been hit only once. <laughs> the others showed rare self-control. Who was the lucky man? He was the great Arctic explorer, the late, uh, the late Raoul Amundsen. But when he found out who I really was, he was so apologetic that tears actually streamed down his grizzled face. <laughs> of which exploit are you proudest? The time I told Clark Gable that he made love like a horse. <laughs> That's as bad as telling the housewives of America there's a better way of washing clothes than with Lux, Lux Flakes. <laughs> well, one word led to another, and Gable, his patience exhausted, challenged me to put up my fists. You think I fight with fists? I answered... Daggers we fight with or nothing. You, the great Gable, foy. <laughs> Thoroughly incensed, Gable came back. I'm sick of this great Gable stuff. You'll fight me now or never. With that, he took a swing, and the host, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., having pity on me, intervened, and all was forgiven. Before I go, Mr. DeMille, do you mind just one question? Oh, I'm suspicious, but go ahead. You've been in Hollywood since movies began. Mm -hmm. But tell me, Mr. DeMille, just what business are you in? <laughs> trying to repeal laws that protect practical jokers. Good night. <laughs> we continue with The Grand Duchess and the Waiter, starring Robert Montgomery and Alyssa Landy, with Jean Lockhart and Alma Kruger. <laughs> Sir. 
Several weeks have passed since Albert disappeared from the hotel in Switzerland. We're back there now, in the main lounge. In the far corner, Metard, the manager, is talking to a well-dressed young man who has just arrived. As we come closer, we discover the young man to be none other than Albert himself. What I want to know is, what are you doing here? What I want to know is, where is the Grand Duchess Xenia? She's gone. Gone where? I've already told you I don't know. All of them, they left two days after you. Didn't she leave any forwarding address? No. But I've got to find her. Oh, yes, she wanted to see you too. The Countess of Orloff wanted to put the police on your trail. But the Grand Duchess wouldn't let her. Police? What did you do? Steal something? Do I look like a thief? Uh, yes, a little. Thanks. Now, look, Matt, I'll try to think. Did they mention any place, any town, any city, any country where they might have gone? Well, I, I think the Grand Duke said something about Milan. Milan. Yes, or maybe it was a Livorno. Oh. No, no, Milan. But I'm not sure. That's a great help, that is. Well, what more can I say? You're going to look for Yes, her? in Milan or maybe in Livorno. So long, Matt. Uh, uh, goodbye. Duchess Xenia, I've been looking for her for the last two months. But you're not sure she came to Livorno? No. The police are not magicians, senor, but we will do what we can. Thanks. If you can pick up any trail at all. Yes, she was here in Marseille last October. October? Yeah, according to our record, she left for Deauville at the end of the month. Deauville? There was a little trouble with the Grand Duke Peter. Trouble? Yes. He sold some motor cars. Oh, yes, yes, I know that trick, yes. <laughs> Thanks, officer. Grand Duchess for you, monsieur. Good. Where? Go to this address. You will find her there. The cabaret... Uh, uh, cab... Oh, no, 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 no. You must be mistaken. No, monsieur. She's the proprietress. Praskovia, will you shut that door, please? Yes, your highness. Hmm. You needn't bother with calling me your highness any longer. I've told you that 20 times. Oh, but we must keep up appearances. It's good for business. Yes, I know. How much have we taken in tonight? Well, the Grand Duke Peter says 10,000 francs. But the Grand Duke Paul says seven. Yes, probably five. Mm. Where's Peter? At the hat check counter. He's checking the hats while the boy has his supper. Grand Duke checking hats in the cabaret. What a world. Well, if you'll pardon my saying so, your highness, None of us would be here if you'd allowed me to send the police after Stop that. Stop it. I won't have you throwing that up to me all the time. It was my necklace. And if I prefer to let him steal it, that's my business. Yes, Your Highness. Anyway, working's good for us. It certainly kept Peter out of trouble. He hasn't tried to sell a car for six months. <laughs> Hello, my love. Come in, Peter. How's business? Ah, never better, never better. I I've checked 120 hats in an hour. You get any tips? Uh, tips? Uh, now, don't be vulgar. Your Highness. Yes? Will you check this bill, please? Here, uh, let me see it. I'll, uh, 124, 36, 400. Why, this seems to be correctly totaled. Yes, it lacks imagination. Your Highness. Add another 50 francs. What, 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 what for? What for? The, uh, the, the flowers. But, but, but they, they didn't have any. Well, what's that got to do with it? I say... Peter, that... leave that bill alone. Do you want to get into trouble again? Oh, very well. Oh, uh, Your Highness. Yes? There's a young man at the corner table. He asked to see you. Well, I'm in for it again. They all want to meet a real Grand Duchess. After all, you can't blame them, and it's... Good for business. I'll see you later, Peter. Uh, yes, my sweet. Good evening, Your Highness. Oh, you? Oh, here, here. Now, don't faint. Oh, I have no intention of fainting. I'm relieved. Will you sit down? No, not here. Come outside in the balcony. Thank you. Well, what 
you doing here? I might ask you the same thing. Well, I should think you'd be ashamed to show your face after what you oh, did. Oh, you mean my disappearing act. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to speak to you before I left. I was in a hurry. I can imagine. I never thought you'd leave the hotel without hearing from me. It wasn't exactly honest, was it? Honest? What are you talking about? Well, you might have left word for me. If this is a joke, I'm not appreciating it. What did you come here for? First, to see you. Second, to return your necklace. Oh, then... Then you did take it? Yes, of course I did. But... but why? Isn't it obvious? I knew you were planning to sell it. I also knew you didn't want to sell it, so I took it. Took it away with me for safekeeping. There you are. Oh, good Lord. What's the matter? I... I don't know. I... I'm all confused. You didn't think I stole it, did you? Oh, I don't know what I thought. That money. All that money you had. Where did you get it? It was mine. You were only a waiter at the hotel. Yes, but I owned it. Owned what? The hotel. You owned... <laughs> Now, control yourself. I can't. What's so funny about a man owning a hotel? Every hotel is owned by somebody. But you, you were wait. I was only learning the business. Will you please explain what this is? Well, it's very simple. You see, when my old uncle died, heaven rest his soul, he left me six hotels all over Europe with a proviso that I start from the bottom and learn everything about running them. So I became a waiter. Had to be a secret, of course, so even Matar didn't know. No, but But I... when I left Switzerland, I went to Paris to see the trustee. I convinced him, and I, I knew the business. He was easily convinced. And I got control of the hotels. You own six hotels? No, 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 I sold them. Oh, why? Well, you had to marry a nobleman. A man can't be a nobleman and a hotel proprietor at the same time. Well, you are crazy. But I am a nobleman. How? On the way back, I stopped in Latvonia. I donated enough money to build a new hospital, and to show their appreciation, they made me something. What was it? Oh, yes, a duke, a duke. I'm the duke of, uh, the duke of Stetvig. The duke of Stetvig? Yes, is it important? I never heard of it. <laughs> Neither did I. <laughs> well, am I noble enough? Am I? You. Well, we've changed around a little since the last time. And I still love you. I still love you. There's a justice on the next street. Shall we? I'll think it over on the way. My arm, Duchess. Thank you, Duke. <laughs> The curtain falls and boy gets girl, proving again that everything comes to him who waits, even if he waits on tables. And if we wait just a few minutes, we'll find Robert Montgomery and Alyssa Landy back at our microphone. Every great picture you see on the screen represents weeks of careful research. Not only must every detail be accurate, but names of characters and places must be selected to avoid any legal complications. Tonight, we hear from the head of the research department of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios, Mrs. Natalie Bucknall. Her name is one many will recall from World War days. As a volunteer nurse in Russia, she was personally presented with the Medal of St. George for Bravery by Tsar Nicholas. In 1917, she fought with the famous Second Woman's Battalion of Death. Later, she became a British Secret Service agent, and in 1919, was made head of the aid post of the British military mission in Russia. Called a second Florence Nightingale by the British government, she is one of the three foreign-born women ever to have been honored with the order of the British Empire. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Natalie Bucknall. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. Such an introduction really makes me feel less nervous when facing or, should I say, speaking to all these thousands of charming invisible people. Rather terrifying, even after the war experiences. But here goes. As you said, it is the job of my department to eliminate from our pictures wherever possible what are referred to as boners. I mean, obvious errors in fact, and the less obvious errors which would lead to legal complications through unintentional duplication of names of characters and places. Of course, it is impossible always to be absolutely correct or safe, but we do try hard. And I must say, MGM have been rather successful. The best way to illustrate this would be to give examples, I think. Someone in our picture after the thin man jumps into a taxi and tells the driver to take him to 346 Smith Street. Well, it would take the driver not only hours, but days and months to find that address in San Francisco, simply because there isn't such a street. 
And what about opening a nice, fat bank account at the Bay City Trust Bank, which you will hear mentioned in the same picture? Just try and do it. It's not there. When you hear a telephone number, don't waste your time calling it, no matter how beautiful the blonde is who lives there on the screen. The number belongs to either a theater owned by MGM, or it's an exclusive number rented by the studio from a phone company. Or you will see a gorgeous dress in our lot of Mrs. Cheney, and you will hear it mentioned in dialogue that it was bought from a chic little modiste, Madame Nathalie. You would adore to order the same model. But I know that you will never get it delivered. You see, it's supposedly my shop in London, but I'm not in London, and I haven't got a shop. It's just my name. Suppose we want to show a lovely lady using Lux Flakes. Naturally, we want to show Lux Flakes because we know there is nothing that could take its place on or off the screen. But we would never use that name without getting permission. Do you remember the devil doll and a police notice being torn off the wall and right above that notice was another one with a horrible photograph bearing the significant inscription, Natalie Bucknell, wanted for kidnapping. Am I? I suppose I may eventually develop criminal tendencies for all I know. But you see, after all, pictures must have villains, and villains must have names. And so we get permission from our employees to loan their names to the gangsters in Simon Legree's of the screen. Our work is really great fun, because all the time we come across the most unusual things. But perhaps one of the most amusing but toughest assignments was to check the Italian rules of table etiquette for Romeo and Juliet. And what did we find? But we were as modern as can be. Don't drink too much. Don't test the heat of the soup with your forefinger. Perhaps it was polite to use only the thumb. Say that all the dishes are good. Wouldn't a modern hostess love to hear that? Don't place your elbows on the table. Don't sit with crossed legs or lean forward. Don't gulp. The famous free don'ts of my own childhood. How many times did I hear my nurse repeat them to me? And so no doubt have you. And here, I think, is the sanest advice of all. It is sometimes better not to seat relatives together at a banquet, but to seat other guests between them. And with this sage bit of philosophy, may I say thank you and good night. Good night, Mrs. Butler. We bring back our Grand Duchess and our equally grand waiter. Ladies and gentlemen, Alyssa Landy and Robert Montgomery. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. This has been a most enjoyable evening, up to now. Yes, I agree. You see, in pictures, I always seem to be, rather, be the rather easygoing young man who gets all the smart lines to say, but drop me in front of a microphone, and what have you got? A babe in the woods. At heart, I'm just a farmer. Well, as one farmer to another, how did you find crops this fall? Well, fair to Midland, Mr. DeMille, fair to Midland. <laughs> <coughs> and I'll have you know, sir, I'm not fooling. I spent a couple of months early this fall on the Montgomery homestead in Upper New York. Just another of those gentlemen farmers, I suppose, who plow from the easy chair to the front porch? Is that so? Just take a look at these calluses on my hands. Back on the farm, they say I make a pitchfork pitch like gee whiz. But suppose you tell me what you've been doing. Oh, gardening, too. The oranges are doing fine, thank you. And how's the new book? That'll be something for the critics to decide. I mean, when's it going to be published? Well, not before too long, I hope. Well, then we're just uh, too early to congratulate you on your new novel and just a day too late to congratulate you on your birthday. If it were today, we might have had a party. It couldn't have been any more fun than being on your show tonight. Mm -hmm. I only hope the audience had as much pleasure listening to us as I have in listening to the Lux Radio Theater every Monday evening. And now, Mr. DeMille, good night. Good night. Good night, Miss Landy. Good night, Mr. DeMille. Mr. Montgomery, Miss Landy, our thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your announcer, Melville Rook. Before Mr. DeMille tells us of next week's play, may I say that our stars tonight appeared through courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios. Mr. Montgomery will be seen next with Joan Crawford and William Powell in The Last of Mrs. Cheney. And Miss Landy's new film is entitled After the Thin Man. Mr. DeMille, as you know, is from Paramount. Mrs. Bucknell, MGM. Miss Kruger, currently appearing in Love Letters of a Star, is from Universal Studios. And Mr. Silver's 20th Century Fox, where he was in charge of music for Banjo on My Knee. Mr. Lockhart is seen in MGM's The Devil is a Sissy and Vince Barnett in A Star is Born. In our cast tonight 
with Jean Lockhart as the Grand Duke Peter, Alma Kruger as the Countess Zavallo, Lionel Pape as the Grand Duke Paul, Byron Folger as Matard, Margaret Brayton as Henrietta, Edwin Max as the Russian waiter, Lou Merrill as an Italian officer, and Frank Nelson as Henry. And here's Mr. DeMille. Ladies and gentlemen, next Monday night, the Lux Radio Theater stars Gene Harlow and Robert Taylor with Claude Rains. Our play, Madame Saint-Jean, a story of France after the Revolution, in which Napoleon takes an empire, and Jean Harlow, as the laundress who becomes a noblewoman, takes Napoleon. <laughs> Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Gene Harlow and Robert Taylor in Madame Saint-Jean with Claude Rains and C. Henry Gordon. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.